Centre during June 1986. The theme for the school is the wonder of worship and this study entitled The Joy and Reverence of Worship. presence is fullness of joy from Psalm 16 verse 11 and then from Revelation 1 a passage that Grant took us to last night when I saw him John says I fell at his feet as a dead man in your presence David says is fullness of joy John says when I saw him I fell at his feet like a dead man. Fullness of joy and fullness of fear. <coughs> Is it a matter then I wonder of uh, now we have joy and then we have fear or now we have praise and then we have uh, some kind of somber spirit. Both of these men were mature, what we would say mature in faith in other words, their response was not out of some kind of weakened conscience. But both men discovered uh, in their various situations a different expression of worship. Neither was a response of their mood. or their feelings or their theology and neither was it a response that one saw this side of God and one saw the other as if God somehow had two faces and to catch a glimpse of one would leave a person prostrated and to catch a glimpse of the other would leave a person exalted We haven't time to, to, to explore it, but it's interesting that both of these men on other occasions experienced the other dynamic. <clears throat> David himself on several occasions speaks of tasting the Lord's goodness, taking refuge in him and fearing him all in the same breath. 
and being in need of nothing. And in one psalm, actually, he, he actually prays that God will unite his heart to fear him. That is, that, that God will give him a single-minded heart that it will be totally caught up in the fear of the Lord. And out of that, David goes on to say, I will, will give thanks to thee. O Lord, with all my heart, glorify, uh, I will glorify your name forever, for your loving kindness toward me is great. So David, at least, and we haven't time to look at John, but the same obtains there. David, David doesn't see any uh, kind of tension between saying, unite my heart of heart to fear you Lord and out of that will flow a whole uh, revolution of joy so whatever we understand in our worship in terms of joy and reverence we must not rightly understood we must not see some kind of, of divorce between joy and reverence I want to pursue that through this study and, and ask the spirit to lead us in that I, I'm conscious that in both of those areas that you just can't define joy, you can't define reverence. They are not something that we think through, they are something that we move through and move into and something that, that, that constrains the heart and sure it has an effect on the mind and the brain and the way we think and the way we express ourselves but essentially this joy that, that grasped David this fullness of joy it came through the gut and the fear that constrained John, John when he fell as a dead man was not something that he had time to think about <coughs> in your presence is fullness of joy when I saw him I fell at his feet as a dead man what's the common factor in these two verses well, worship is common, but there's something else, and that is that both we were aware that they were in the presence of the living God. That's the common factor. That's the stimulation for both of their responses. Worship, of course, as we've seen through the whole weekend, is that response of the heart, not just in word, in praise or in rejoicing, but in the joy of a life lived within a creation in which we feel at home, the joy and service of a life lived within a people of God amongst whom we feel at home. That's our joy of service and our joy of worship. That's the response of the heart. That is worship. If you look at your notes, and I'm not going to follow them um, too rigidly, but the second heading there, we see the joy that creation brings and in the scriptures it's clear that the true response of the heart to the creation is joy not because it's good and it is good and it's beautiful and we can with the poets we can be overwhelmed can't we with the sense of intricacy and color and beauty but that's not the stimulation for worship in in essence the stimulation for worship is that within all of that color and within all of that beauty we discover God God is there, not locked into the rock or the tree, but he's there having made it and, having, and is in the process of keeping it and bringing it to his plan. And, and that's multiplied many times when we look at his creatures in creation. So we see God in it. We just don't see the beauty of his handiwork in it. If you turn to Psalm 139, and the key of all of this is, is that in the presence of God when I saw God worship is, is, a, is a, a response of the heart whether we see it in creation whether we see him in creation or in grace or in salvation it's always a response to the fact that God is there the presence of the living God Lord you've searched me David says you know when I sit down you know when I rise up you understand my thought from afar you scrutinize my path and my lying down. You're intimately acquainted with all my ways, even before there was a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all. You've enclosed me behind me for and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. 
It's too high, I can't attain to it. Verse 13, you formed me in my, in you formed, sorry, you did form my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I'll give thanks to you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was made in secret. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God, how vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, or should count them, they would outnumber the sand, and when I wake, I am still with you. The whole throb there of his worship in, in the intimacy and intricacy of who he is as a creature of God, as a creation of God, is that God is with him. And uh, that's how it is for our worship all the time. If we move on to the uh, first paragraph over the page, and I'll let you work through the rest of those in terms of the, the joy that creation brings, we see that the full revelation of God is not brought through a rock or a tree or a sky or a sunset or even the uh, making of man and woman in his own image, but it's when he comes in his actions to redeem and glorify men, so there the constraint is the greatest to worship. If you turn to that passage in Zephaniah, which is the uh, easiest way to find it, is go to the end and the New Test the Old Testament and flip back. In Zephaniah chapter 3, Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. And in that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. So we know very well, don't we, that the one who can actually come to us and penetrate us to the point of our conscience and can actually, having penetrated, release that conscience, that is the one to whom all worship should be given. The presence of the living God to save and to heal. And then in Acts chapter 13, um, as Paul uh, preaches, has, has preached at Antioch, and he finishes verse 47, For thus the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you should bring salvation to the ends of the earth, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. And they were filled continually, he finishes with, uh, with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to, uh, to just focus in to develop this point on the building of the temple, or rather the, the, the great event when God brought his ark, the ark of the covenant, into the new temple in uh, the history of Israel. And then I want us to move from there to see that whatever happened there is a mere shadow of what's happening here and what has happened here. And that the, the great awe and the great joy that flowed there is a trickle a drop in a bucket as to what God is on about through the great uh, filling of his temple of us, the people, his people, over the whole face of the earth with his glory. Well, the whole event uh, that led up to, or the events that led up to the temple of God being ready in Solomon's time for the ark to be brought was really quite, a, quite something. And for anybody who uh, is a little bit against preparation for worship, 
and go back and read that. They spent years preparing for that day and that ongoing day. And right down to the very last little candle snuffer, everything was right. God had prescribed the whole thing and yet what he was about was not a prescription. And as soon as Israel turned it later into a prescription, they lost the whole thing. But he prescribed the whole lot because, as we've seen, it was a gift from him to the people to allow them to worship, to bring with it the freedom of worship, this whole temple, because he was to be there. And God was going to fill that place by his presence. And without his presence, despite the whole glory of it, and it must have been fantastic, despite, uh, without his presence, the whole place would have been a museum, a relic of futility, really. Pathetic. So the whole nation's called together. Just come in your mind's eye to the whole, through the whole story with me. And the Ark of the Covenant is waiting to be brought up into the Holy of Holies. And the first thing that we notice as we come through the crowd, uh, the whole nation is there, is that every second man has brought an ox or a sheep. As we kind of press through, we become aware of the stench of blood. You've been to an abattoirs? You can smell it, can't you? The excreta and the blood. It begins to fill our nostrils and as we press through the crowd we, be, we, we, we suddenly become aware that every low area and every crevice is filled with blood. In fact, uh, the writer records and says that more animals than could be numbered were slaughtered there before the ark comes up. But then, you see, it's not the stench of blood that begins to grip the heart, but it's the, it's the aroma of awe at what that blood is about <coughs> that starts to percolate. And we move through the horror to a human being of, of all of that blood to begin to be aware that what God is about in this particular situation is filled with horror. And yet we're drawn to it because there is great joy in the horror. And then the procession starts and the Levites and the singers, they're all there. They've all been prescribed to have a part. They've all been anointed with the Spirit of God to, to fill that part out. And they've got their cymbals and their harps and their lyres and there's 100, 120 priests with trumpets. It's a recipe for mayhem, isn't it, boys? And as the ark's brought up, the whole choir sings and plays and it's recorded in unison. And the message they sing is the same message that we read in Chronicles when Jehoshaphat had that great victory. The loving kindness of the Lord is everlasting. So somewhere in the horror of being in, in blood up to their ankles, God had communicated to them that he was there and that his everlasting kindness was forever. And they worshipped. And as they bring the thing, the ark, into the, to the temple, God just consumes the place with his glory and fills it. And everything comes to a standstill. The priests can't even stand to minister. There's nothing worse than becoming a redundant leader of worship. There's nothing better either. 
And the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the only one who stands is Solomon. And Solomon stands and he speaks these words. Let me, let's just follow them in Second Chronicles chapter 6. And Solomon stood and said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick cloud. I've built thee a lofty house and a place for thy dwelling. And then the king turned and faced the people and said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth to my father David and has fulfilled it with his hand, saying that he's brought his people from Egypt and so on. But the great significance for Solomon was that uh, here in this house was the living God. It was a staggering thing. If you turn over the page, or you may not have to turn over the page in your Bible, in verses uh, uh, 14 through 18 when he prayed, it was a staggering thing for him that God should be there. And he said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there's no God like thee in heaven or on the earth keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before thee with all their heart, who has kept with your servant David my father that which thou hast promised him. Indeed, thou hast spoken with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thy hand as, it's, as it is this day. Now therefore, O Lord thy God, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father that which you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel if only your sons take heed of their way to walk in my laws. And now therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, let thy word be confirmed, which you spoke to your servant David. But will God indeed dwell with mankind on the earth? Behold, heaven and the, and the highest heaven cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built. So he's confronted with a contradiction. The glory of the Lord fills the house, but he knows that God's glory cannot be contained within that house. Now, there's great worship as the, the Lord fills the house, but that's not the end of it. At the end of his prayer, right through chapter 6, he's praying, and we, we could read that. It would be a great revelation and a great encouragement to worship. But at the end of that, Solomon finishes, and there's a great roaring and the roaring actually uh, becomes manifest in a fire that comes down on the, the altar and burns up all of the sacrifices that have been made. And the glory of the Lord filled the house again, or still. And the priest couldn't enter. And all the people were constrained to worship. The sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, True, truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. Got a stuck record. All I can talk about is grace. Because all they see in the context of the glory of God in the temple is his grace. And then the sacrifices begin again. 22,000 oxen. That blows the mind, doesn't it? And then 120,000 sheep. And again, the whole temple and altar couldn't cope. And notice at the end of it all, Solomon, thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord, the king's palace, and successfully completed all that he planned. And then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. For now I've chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be here forever and my eyes and my heart 
my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now we, you know, we've raced through that, haven't we? But even just having a sniff of it, <clears throat> we can see something of the, the great glory of worship as it was there. The glory of his grace in being there and, and the grace that overflows in worship as a result of that. But, but all of this, as we said at the beginning, is really a shadow play of the true order that's to come. You see, the holiness of all of that blood that sickened the senses with horror and fear when the altar flooded with it becomes the absolute horror of darkness when the Father graces the altar of the cross in history to be the start of a whole new temple. where his glory would be forever. You see, we've been brought near, the scripture says, into a living temple by the blood of Christ. A temple whereby the Spirit, we have continual relationship to the glory of the Father. A holy temple being built together for a dwelling place of God. A house in which we offer spiritual sacrifices. See the, the Levites and the priests and the symbols and the lyres and the trumpets. They're really nothing compared to the great song of praise that God puts on his, the lips of his people when they perceive the in reverence and in joy what eventuated from that cross in God filling his temple the people that he's formed out of that cross with his glory and next time we sit in our churches waiting for something to happen so that we can worship God or get carried along in joy or feel somber in reverence forget it I've got a quote there in the notes uh, from Forsyth. <coughs> Page 34. The holiness of God is the real foundation of religion. Love is but its outgoing. Sin is but its defiance. Grace is but its action on sin. The cross is but its victory. Faith is but its worship. Don't you wish you could have said that? <laughs> <laughs> What we've just seen in Israel and, and, and then on the cross is that there is no joy, there is no reverence apart from an understanding of that. The holiness of God is working out and forming a people, a temple, in which his glory fills. He fills that, that temple with glory. If we move into joy without reverence what do we end up with? We end up with some hollow thing don't we? It's intensely attractive because there's no confrontation. If we attempt to have reverence without joy and I believe that's an impossibility but we can give it a go <coughs> we end up with, with something that is terribly deadly. But when we understand that reverence and joy are of the same essence, that, that joy really comes out of reverence, then it's prophetic. It indicates the presence, you see, of the living God. The God who's in the temple and it's glorious. 
That passage that we read from Second Chronicles, just want to finish with that. The last couple of minutes. These tribes were coming against Israel. And uh, the whole of Judah stood before the Lord and fasted. And the Spirit came upon this uh, Levite. And he served the people. He worshipped God and served the people by bringing a prophetic word. And that prophetic word was that the battle is God's and not yours. You can go out tomorrow, but don't worry, you won't be fighting. And the people worshipped. The Levites served the people with the prophecy, the word of God, and that created worship amongst the people and trust. And, and the action of worship was that they actually went out there in the morning and stood up in front of the enemy and started singing. And their theme, again, have a guess, the loving kindness of the Lord is everlasting. And the whole enemy was routed, you remember, and they were three days, I think it was, collecting up the goodies. And walked back into Jerusalem, great throng, all the people, just imagine the whole thing, what they'd seen. And they returned with great joy with the king, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. And they came with their harps and their lyres and their trumpets, and they came to the temple, and the dread of God just kind of dropped. When they began to see that the Lord was present and he'd fought with and for his people, how much more is the service of the living temple bringing the joy and dread of God to the nations? Haven't time to develop that, have we? But just think about the word of the holy love of God that has gone out from the apostles. And we think that the world just puts it aside like that. And we share our testimony with believers, uh, with unbelievers, and it just <coughs> runs off like water, so called, on the duck's back but not at all. If God picks up a prophet in Israel and gives him a word to serve the people and those people come into praise and that praise is the whole beginning of a victory in battle and then that, that goes from praise to high praise when they come back seeing the greatness of the glory of God. How much more, how much more does the prophetic word from the cross of the Father's great priest boom out across the nations and bring with it, if we will only see it by faith, the whole dread and joy of what God is all about. The joy and reverence of worship. Paul prays a benediction in the end of his uh, Romans uh, letter in Romans 15, but before we come to that benediction, he says this in verse 8, For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the Father, fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy as it's written, Therefore I will give praises to thee among the Gentiles. I will sing to thy name Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, as I said, there shall, come the, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles hope. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. For we've received a kingdom. The writer to the Hebrews says, Since we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we show gratitude by which we offer to God 
an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire.